Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Monty Hart lecture series. It's a, I hope you have a you had a good Thanksgiving and today, the first day afterwards, we had we have here the honor to have a Beatriz Lopez Melgar, uh, who will be speaking about the role of ultrasound in cardiovascular disease prevention. Dr. Melgar, Melgar graduated in 2005 from uh, Autonoma University uh, of Madrid and she completed her cardiology training at University Hospital Dose de Octubre in Madrid. And then she went ahead to perform advanced imaging training at UCSF at and at University Hospital. She did her PhD with a mentor that we all know, Dr. Valentin Puster, and she focused as her topic on the use of imaging techniques for the study of atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease risk. She was one of the main authors of the PESA study that we all know, and she has published over 40 articles. And I think she's leading the research in the use of ultrasound for the detection of uh, subclinical atherosclerosis. So thank you very much, Beatriz, for being here with us. Looking forward to your talk. Well, good morning, everyone. And thank you, Leandro, for your introduction. And Thanks for your invitation. It's, this is truly an honor to be part of this fantastic series of conferences. And also it's a pleasure to speak here to a multimodality audience. I consider myself a, a multimodality imager too, but then I started my work in the population-based studies for cardiovascular disease risk prevention. And I realized the broad interface between preventive cardiology and imanin and how imagers, we, are in the best position, I think, to help implement preventative, strat preventative strategies in patients. And this talk will focus on ultrasound, but I think this concept uh, can be extended to CT and MR2. So my objective today is to show you the multiple possibilities that ultrasound brings us uh, for cardiovascular disease prevention uh, what do the guidelines say on the use of ultrasound and what are new research aspects to push this field forward. So the role of ultrasound in cardiovascular disease prevention is primarily the study of atherosclerosis and that is why I'll focus my talk on vascular ultrasound and its use in primary prevention. And this is the presentation scheme. So let's start trying to answer the first question. Is it necessary to optimize cardiovascular disease risk assessment the way we traditionally do it? Okay, we all know that traditional cardiovascular risk assessment based on the evaluation of age, sex, and conventional cardiovascular risk factors is inaccurate. But what exactly does, does this mean? Well, if we use clinical scales, scales for example, the ACC AHA pool core equation, or the European score to classify our patient's risk, we will find that 30 to 40% of the population will be classified into the low risk category. So perfect. We just need to advise them to keep their healthy lifestyle. That's all. Also, we will find that 20 to 30% of them will be classified into the high risk category. So again, we also know what to do. We will prescribe them preventive therapy with the statins and probably a aspirin, and we'll manage uh, cardiovascular risk factors aggressively. But then the problem comes when we find out that the 40 to 50% of the population will be classified in the median risk category. And here, we don't know exactly what to do. And more importantly, the majority of the cardiovascular events will appear in patients categorized as low and intermediate risk, just because these two categories bring together the majority of the population. It is a probability game. And this has been called the epidemiological paradox. Now we can see the enormous dimension that biomarkers can take. And that is the way we are looking for simple, non-expensive and widely available markers to identify those patients at true high risk for clinical events despite conventional risk estimates. And the 
easiest way to improve conventional evaluation is to address the presence of cardiovascular uh, disease risk modifiers or enhancers. This concept is endorsed by current clinical guidelines. After clinical evaluation, these guidelines recommend to evaluate these several clinical situations that when they are present, they enhance patients' spatial risk or the clinically estimated risk. They tell us how, uh, they tell us who is at a higher risk and consequently would benefit for a more aggressive uh, cardiovascular disease uh, treatment. But these clinical modifiers or enhancers are multiple. And if they are present, what value do we give to them? Their effect on each individual is variable and difficult to estimate. Here I underline uh, the most common cardiovascular risk enhancers, such as family history of coronary heart disease, the presence of metabolic syndrome or systemic inflammatory or autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, or conditions that is increasing, as for example, the, the cancer survivors, and also other conditions that are sex specific, such as premature menopause or have had a preeclampsia, gestational di diabetes, preterm delivery, or poly uh, polycystic ovary syndrome. On the other hand, we have biomarkers for cardiovascular disease risk for stratification. They can be quantified, so we can determine cutoff values of pronostic relevance, and consequently, their impact on each individual can be better defined. They can be of two types. Let's see, one, are the parameters measured in blood samples? But in recent guidelines, image-based biomarkers are becoming more relevant, especially those based on atherosclerosis plaque -like evaluation. And I think this is mainly because of two facts. And this is an illustration from, from Dr. Michael Blaha that summarizes this idea. Both lab and image-based biomarkers, when positive, they upgrade the patient's clinically estimated risk. But only image-based biomarkers can act as a downgrading factor. When atherosclerosis is ruled out, the patient is at a lower risk than that clinically estimated. So you can consider a conservative management. This has been called the power of serum that you mainly all know. So summarizing, Image-based biomarkers are gaining relevance in current clinical guidelines and because mainly they can act as a truly risk stratifying tool. They can not only upgrade, but also downgrade a patient's risk. Having said so, let's overview together what markers do we have using ultrasounds, when should we use them, making reference to current clinical recommendations, and consensus documents, and how can we use them? So ultrasound-based markers for cardiovascular uh, disease risk evaluation have significantly changed over the years, just as a reflection of a larger shift in the paradigm of clinical atherosclerosis assessment. And more importantly, clinical guidelines have been changing their, their recommendations accordingly. And the first big moment in the history of vascular ultrasounds took place in 2013 when carotid intima media thickness was no longer recommended for cardiovascular risk assessment in the ACC AHA guidelines. This was a result of evidence provided by population-based studies and two large meta-analyses where the pronostic value of CIMT was demonstrated to be lower than the simple description of atherosclerosis plaque presence. Multiple cardiovascular risk markers um, based on direct plaque evaluation had been evaluated at the time. However, they were not endorsed uh, by these guidelines. Until ACC AHA societies recognized uh, the, the relevance of plaque burden assessment for the first time in 2019 with a 2A class of recommendation. Not only they recognize the potential clinical uses of plaque burden measured by coronary artery calcium score, but also the potential value of carotid plaque burden assessment. And this paradigm shift was later seconded by the European Society of Cardiology in their guidelines of 2019 and 2020, who included for the first time 
the use of an ultrasound based uh, marker over calcium scores. And this is the arterial uh, carotid anorthemonal plaque burden on arterial uh, ultrasonography set to a class of recommendation. And this relevant change for ultrasound uh, markers uh, was motivated by the HRP study led by Dr. Valentin Fustier. Uh, this study used a first generation 3D vascular ultrasound technology to quantify carotid plaque burden in a cohort of 52 FTAs, 85 uh, years old and cardiovascular disease free individual. The study demonstrated that carotid plaque burden predict cardiovascular events, here you have the curves, uh, in a similar manner to coronary artery calcium skull. This is the curves, you can see they look pretty similar and also improved the statin allocation in a second publication in 2016. But ESC guidelines also introduced another breakthrough in cardiovascular risk assessment, the concept of multi-territorial evaluation over traditional evaluation limited to the carotid territory. And the PESA Phoenix Santander study here, led by Dr. Valentin Fuster, has contributed to this paradigm shift as it revealed that iliofemoral territory evaluated by vascular ultrasound was the most frequently affected territory by subclinical atherosclerosis over carotid territory, and more importantly, over coronary territory uh, evaluated by coronary artery calcium score. Moreover, PESA participants were evaluated uh, for carotid and femoral plaque burden by actual technology uh, in 3D vascular ultrasound. And, um, Study results prove that femoral plaque volume, a simple um, marker re that relates to cardiovascular risk factors and estimated cardiovascular risk better than uh, carotid uh, plaque volume for these middle aged individuals. And this is a frequent situation that I face in my clinical practice. This is the case of a young man of 41 years old with hypertension since he was 34, mild dyslipidemia and metabolic syndrome. And conventional clinical scores classified him in a low risk category, but we all know that um, the limitation of clinical scores in young individuals, and especially when non-conventional risk factors are present. Thus, we explore the carotid territory, finding normal CIMT values and absence of carotid atherosclerosis. Then we explored femoral territory and found a surprisingly high atherosclerosis burden for a young man. If I had not explored the femoral arteries, I would have missed critical information for managing this patient. Summarizing, atherosclerosis plaque burden is the currently accepted market, not only for carotids, but also for femoral arteries and preferably evaluated by 3D method, if available, as stated by a recent uh, consensus document that I will uh, revise later. Let's now review the indications for the use of ultrasound imaging in cardiovascular uh, disease risk assessment using real clinical cases. Here, the first indication to classify patients. This is a 70, uh, sorry, a 57 years old woman with um, not treated dyslipidemia and family history of early coronary heart disease without other cardiovascular risk factors. With this information, it's reasonable to initiate the studies despite her clinically estimated risk of 2.6. However, we decided to evaluate carotid and femoral arteries with ultrasounds and she had normal CMT values but a very extensive atherosclerosis disease with plaques in the four explored territories with high atherosclerosis burden, three millimeters maximum plaque thickness and very high uh, plaque volume percentile. And more importantly, we found the presence of significant stenosis in the left carotid artery as displayed in the volume rendering image. So this question is now for you. How would you treat this patient? You will prescribe lifestyle therapy only, 
maybe moderate statin therapy, high intensity statin therapy, or uh, high intensity statins with an allele goal of less than 55, um, and considering also HASPI. Okay, so looking at guidelines to detect asymptomatic atherosclerotic plaques causing significant stenosis, this is more than 50% is considered a clinical-like event and directly classifies your patient in a very high-risk category. So this is what we did. We initiated studies with an LDL goal of less than 55 and maybe consider aspirin depending on her breathing risk. We can discuss later, um, later in the debate after the, the talk. And this is the second indication to re-stratify intermediate risk patients. This is another case, a 61-year-old uh, man with mild dyslipidemia, family history of early coronary heart disease, former smoker, and pre-hypertension. Pre he was an intermediate risk patient with one risk enhancer, his family history, but he was reluctant to initiate a study. And so we performed carotid and femoral ultrasound and found very extensive disease with the four territories affected, and again, with very high uh, plaque burden. So again, how would you treat these patients? You have the same options here. Maybe you are thinking in a high intensity, doubt when high intensity less than 55. Well, look at the guidelines. Uh, guidelines support the use of imaging to upgrade or downgrade the risk category in patients at an intermediate so in this case, we consider our patient a high-risk patient, but not a very high-risk patient. So we decided to initiate the studies with an LDL goal of less than 70, right? And as you may notice, there was something recurring in all these patients that, that I have presented. The presence of non-conventional risk factors. As, as I previously said, uh, they are clinical situations that are not included in risk scales, but they are considered to be risk enhancing. So one individual may have one or more than one of these factors. Therefore, most of the times it's difficult to determine their specific effect in each individual. This is why we refer to these patients as patients with unknown or undetermined cardiovascular disease risk. And imaging can capture the actual effect of these enhancers and help to guide the treatment. And this is, to me, the third indication. Let's see uh, a case uh, regarding this uh, unknown or undetermined cardiovascular disease risk. For example, this is a 58 years old woman with a, um, a strong family history of early coronary heart disease and mild dyslipidemia. She, um, that she controls with a very healthy lifestyle and practicing sports and diet, but she was worried about her risk for developing coronary events because of his familial history. So we performed a 3D vascular ultrasound and all markers were negative. And what we have learned from PESA study that the probability of having a positive coronary artery calcium score in the absence of plaques in both the carotid and femoral territories is practically zero. So we didn't go for another test and just show her the results uh, of his negative echo and encourage her to continue her good habits. And I want to stress this point, to show her the echo results because knowing your atherosclerosis is a stimulus to improve lifestyle and to uh, comply with treatment. This simple strategy has shown to improve prognosis and reduce cardiovascular events in primary prevention patients in this controlled randomized trial. And also, uh, as vascular ultrasound uh, is an expensive, radiation-free, and bedside technique, we can use it as an opportunistic test to study atherosclerosis burden, for example, in this case of a 51 years old woman with mild dyslipidemia, current smoker, five to 10 cigarettes per day, but not a heavy smoker, 
and familiar history of coronary heart disease. Her father had a myocardial infarction at the age of 52. Therefore, we decided to do a carotid and femoral vascular ultrasound. And ultrasound uh, found that she had normal CMT values, but a very extensive atherosclerosis disease with plaques in the four explored territories with high atherosclerosis, pardon, 1.9 millimeters maximum plaque thickness and very high uh, plaque volume percentage. So it seems to us uh, that there was a discrepancy between the clinical data and the ultrasound findings. So we decided to expand the study of other atypical risk factors and find very high levels of lipoprotein A in this patient. So in this case, the assessment of burden of other sclerosis on ultrasound by ultrasound put us on the path to discovering other risk situations different from those that are usually studied. So because overall atherosclerosis plaque burden assessment can help us in making difficult uh, clinical decision, uh, this is a snapshot from the American guidelines for the management of these lipidemias on the use of atherosclerosis burden assessment. Well, in this case, they refer mainly to the coronary artery calcium score to guide patients, uh, for example, reluctant to initiate the studies or those who wish to understand the risk and, and potential uh, benefit uh, more precisely, or for those patients concerned about the need to reinstitute the study therapy after discontinuation for studying associated symptoms. And, but this, although established for coronary artery calcium score, this might be also applied to atherosclerosis blood burden assessment by other techniques, as, as for example, by vascular ultrasounds. And more interestingly, I think that carotid and femoral vascular ultrasounds would overcome situations where the use of coronary artery calcium score is at least controversial. For example, patients already under studies or patients with a tax of zero, but a clinical situation that put them at a higher risk. For example, those with uh, diabetes, or heavier smoker or with familiar history of uh, coronary heart disease or very young patients in whom calcification um, in atherosclerotic plaques hasn't appeared yet. But despite the increasing evidence that support the pronostic value of image-based biomarkers, the newest ESC guidelines downgrade the, their use to a 2B class of recommendation. They acknowledge that ultrasound probably also reclassify uh, cardiovascular risk and may be considered as a risk modifier, but limits its use when calcium scoring is not feasible. Of note, they specifically mentioned to use carotid ultrasounds for plaque detection, but without more detail. And about this concept of plaque detection by vascular ultrasound, this includes a broad spectrum of atherosclerosis. This is a stages and does not capture at all different risk stratus. Uh, you can see in this slide, the differences between this early plaque or this advanced plaque with high risk features or with this is uh, the, the, the concept of uh, plaque detection does not capture at all uh, the, the, the whole spectrum of atherosclerosis disease related to uh, cardiovascular disease risk. And now, how can we use plaque burden evaluation? There are two main strategies here. We have um, one strategy that is a 3D thickness based strategy that uses absolute cutoff values of maximum plaque thickness. And the second strategy is a percentile-based strategy described for 3D plaque volume measurement. The first strategy is well described in this consensus paper published in 2020. Um, one limitation of this uh, consensus is that only focus on carotid ultrasound. And this consensus uh, document after reviewing all markers uh, of plaque burden and their literature, they propose an algorithm based on maximum plaque thickness to restratify patients. And they established 
in the document, preferably measured by 3D methods. They use the absolute cutoff value of 2.5 millimeters to encourage treatment in patients and in patients under risk uh, discussion or intermediate risk patients. And you can also use other details uh, based on plaque features assessment um, that are well uh, described in the document if you are interested in, in read it and, and study it for a more detailed um, evaluation. And the second one is the percentile based strategy. Well, this is strategy using percentile um, is uh, putting your patient in relation to a reference score for normality. And this strategy has been used previously for other cardiovascular risk markers uh, like uh, CIMT and the calcium score too. In this regard, well, this study reported the values and percentiles of carotid and femoral plaque burden in, in its population. However, well, to use uh, this carotid and femoral plaque burden measurement in clinical practice in a similar manner to coronary artery calcium score, I think that more steps need to be taken. There is a clear need to conduct uh, large multi-ethnic population-based studies to obtain normative data and determine part of values of that volume uh, of pronostic relevance. But before revising uh, the future directions of vascular ultrasound-based markers, I would like to raise here another question of interest. Uh, that is, what about the cost benefit of using vascular ultrasound for allocating prevention, uh, preventive treatment on top of conventional clinical evaluation? And since there are not uh, published uh, studies on cost effectiveness uh, data, I share here with you the uh, study that my group presented in the ESC Congress, whose aim was to know the potential value of using carotid and, and femoral 3D vascular ultrasounds in the real world. And the study shows uh, the results of the first cardiovascular disease uh, prevention program that uses 3D vascular ultrasound to guide preventive treatment. We included 163 patients referred to our unit uh, mainly because they were moderate risk or they had non-conventional or atypical risk factors. Uh, for example, family history and metabolic syndrome were the, were the most frequent reasons for referral. And after using conventional risk scales, the use of uh, percentiles of carotid plaque burden by 3D, and we look to see the proportion of patients that we will be able to reclassify following uh, this strategy. And among those patients under risk discussion, um, carotid plaque burden risk stratified 78% of them, recommending statins in half of them and discouraging statins in the other half. In the other half. So it can be potentially a useful tool. And contrary to what some colleagues say, I don't feel like uh, it will boost the prescription of the statins, or at least not as much as other venture. Um, if we make a correct selection of the patients who undergo this step. In addition, carotid plaque burden, risk 35, 30% um, of low risk patients that uh, to recommend the statins. So it possibly improved the detection of low risk patients who would benefit from statin therapy. However, among high risk individuals, carotid, um, carotid uh, plaque burden discouraging statins uh, in 61% of them. So it seems to be limited uh, of limited value in already high risk patients by clinical uh, scores. And last but not least, uh, what are future directions in cardiovascular disease risk prevention using vascular ultrasounds? Well, from, from my point of view, the milestones that will transform clinical um, recommendations in the near future will be first, the evaluation of plaque progression, and second, the vulnerable plaque burden assessment. And why plaque progression? Because it is a necessary step between subclinical atherosclerosis and plaque rupture. 
and plaque progression also gathers the three key aspects in the paradigm of cardiovascular uh, risk assessment. They are plaque development, disease extent, and the presence of adverse plaque features. And more importantly, plaque progression can be halted by intensive lipid lowering therapy. Plaque progression is gaining such relevance that some scientific groups are suggesting to establish treatment goals of secondary prevention for patients with plaque progression. And vascular ultrasound seems to be more sensitive in detecting plaque progression than calcium score. This issue was addressed by the PES study and showed that the new disease onset and disease progression were detected five to 10 times more frequently in non-coronary vessels assessed by 2D, 3D vascular ultrasound than in coronary arteries assessed by coronary artery calcium score. And finally, the assessment of vulnerable uh, plaque burden, as suggested by the score hair trial, a cornerstone clinical trial on the prognosis value of CCT and geography. And this study described how low attenuation plaque burden is a precise marker of cardiovascular uh, risk that predicts maze events, independent of the percentage of plaque, of plaque stenosis, independent of calcium score, and for the first time, independent of overall plaque burden. And this new marker can also be evaluated by vascular ultrasound. However, any accurate evaluation of the combined study of plaque burden and plaque features is only possible with novel 3D technologies that are currently uh, being developed. In this example, this is a video of the new uh, 3D analysis tool that is uh, driven by uh, artificial intelligence uh, analysis algorithms, looking for a more fast, simple, reliable, and with uh, very low uh, inter and inter server variability that is currently developed. And also you have here the new possibility using these uh, art uh, artificial intelligent algorithms to evaluate um, plaque composition in the whole 3D vessel volume analysis. So in conclusion, the uh, five takeaways. I think that the history of ultrasound-based marker is ultimately the history of subclinical atherosclerosis evaluation for cardiovascular disease risk assessment. Um, carotid and femoral plaque burden is the ultrasound-based marker recommended by current clinical guidelines. And strategies for use in clinical practice are currently under evaluation and recommend primarily 2D plaque um, measurements such as plaque thickness, but ideally assessed with a 3D method. And if you have a 3D method, of course, use them plaque volume too. And the advent of new 3D methods for sure will enhance the evaluation of plaque progression and adverse plaque uh, burden as future markers of cardiovascular disease risk. Uh, because to me, the ultimate goal of these techniques is to make ultrasound competitive in terms of accuracy for cardiovascular disease risk prediction against computer tomography and magnetic uh, resonance imaging, because ultrasounds are already competitive uh, in terms of cost and availability. So thank you for your attention, and I'd be delighted to answer any question. Thank you so much, uh, Beatrice. This was amazing. Uh, I think you, like I mentioned before, I think you're pushing the limits in a in a very interesting topic and, and unique technology that could be applied all over the world. Uh, so please put your questions in the in the Q and A, and you have there the the code for for CME. Uh, so I think as a as a first question, we can start with one from Daniel Lorenzati. But I think in part you answer, but he says, what do you think is the best cost benefit approach for the evaluation of subclinical atherosclerosis? Should we look in all the vascular territories combining CAC and ultrasound, or is there any clinical context when we can do just one and not the other? 
Okay, well, I think that the, the key point here is to evaluate atherosclerosis plaque burden in the individual. If you, uh, have, no, if you have doubts or you are not confident with your clinical decision because it's the, the marker that is going to help you best um, in comparison to many others that have been studied previously. And second, use the technique that is available in your, in your center. I know in, in, in um, discussing with other colleagues that the, most of you have coronary artery calcium score very viable and it's not uh, expensive. So if you have confidence and it's it, uh, afford, if it is viable in your center, go for it. If you have ultrasound, I think ultrasound is, is also uh, inexpensive. You can use it um, in the first visit, so you don't need a second visit to um, to to see again your patient to to comment with him the results. And also, it has a very uh, to me, based on my own experience, it has a, another advantage: is that you can talk directly to the patient, show him the results, show him uh, or her uh, the, the vessels, and tell uh, the patient truly understand the risk and comply with your advices because they can see and have a direct feeling with you on what is going on inside their arteries because uh, blood tests or whatever, they, they don't, they are just um, factors that doesn't, well, they are in a paper and when they see the arteries with you, they really uh, uh, understand the risk and comply with, with the therapy. I'm, I don't fight for a calcium or vascular ultrasound. I just say use atherosclerosis assessment and use a technique that you have in your center. Yeah, I think one or the other is better than nothing. And we know that for sure. And I think coming to, to the point that you mentioned, uh, how long does it take to do a, a full assessment or, of carotids and, and femoral? And how long to do it and how long to train your technicians to do it? So for someone that is trained for echocardiography, to jump into the world of vascular ultrasounds is quite simple. So uh, don't be afraid, uh, vascular ultrasound is far easier than the echocardiography. And uh, how long does it take in, in the patient in your visit? I usually program uh, a 10 minutes, uh, 10 to 15 minutes exploration in my, in my consultation for the, for the vascular ultrasound because yes, you need that the patient uh, take off all the clothes uh, because you need to address not only the carotid but also the inguinal uh, territory. Um, but in 15 minutes, minutes with experience, the 10 minutes to scan, five minutes to undress and press again. And another important thing is all the tools that we are currently developing with uh, artificial intelligence that will speed up the analysis too. But today, the analysis tools are a little bit complex. They need more training than the scanning. But this is uh, to do a 3D. But if you have a 2D, this is fast. You can obtain your measurements directly uh, while doing your, your scan. Yeah, so 10, 15 minutes is actually pretty fast. So maybe yeah. it's because I have a lot of experience. <laughs> Yeah, no, but that's that's good. That's a that's a goal at least. So a question from a uh, Rob Osfeld, or direct, director of uh, preventive cardiology, it says: Are there ultrasound imaging strategies you suggest as an outcome measure for research studies investigating the short-term impact of interventions, either medications or lifestyle interventions on plaque? Yes, I, I don't have much experience in monitoring treatment with, with uh, vascular ultrasound. Uh, there are other groups that have, uh, uh, they have done it and they are very optimistic in, in reporting that they can detect changes very early in three months of follow-up, something like that. Um, I have more experience in monitoring uh, the natural history of, of atherosclerosis, the, the natural history of developing atherosclerosis. 
uh, this is useful too if you want some reference for your clinic. If you are following a patient without treatment or with a, a lifestyle intervention, maybe you can re-scan uh, it. Um, it depends on their basal risk. If they are low risk, I wouldn't repeat an echo uh, before three years, more or less. And, but the, if they are moderate or high risk, maybe you can go for an echo uh, yearly to see, to see the changes in, in, in the prognosis burden. How do you, I think following that question, how do you define a progression or a regression? Are there any cutoffs or use changes in percentile? Mm -hmm. It was, it is challenging. It is challenging. In fact, when we uh, study a progression in PESA study, we were revising a lot of uh, bibliography and nothing was, um, nothing was conventionally established yet. So we decided to base to, to set up a new definition based in two things. One is the, the variability of the measurements because we define progression and regression in 2D vascular ultrasounds and in 3D vascular ultrasound. And taking into account the, the, the variability of the measurement and the natural uh, history in, in the PESA study, uh, we established, um, but you can read the paper. I remember it was the development of two plaques in detected by 2D or 3D plaque presence in the four territories. So if you check the, the two carotids and the two femorals, the development of two plaques in three years, it was considered progression. And uh, to double the plaque volume uh, in three years, it was considered also progression. And we, I think the progression that we, the definition of progression in 3D was very high because we had very small plaques because PESA participants are very young. So you need to double a plaque from five millimeters cube, let's say, to 10 millimeters cube to avoid variability and establish that they are truly progressing. That's, a, that's, that's very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, I think in, we, we had the last, last week, we had Dr. Shapiro talking about the early interventions and the, the larger effects of early interventions when you treat lipids throughout life, through, through lifespan. So um, what do you think are the reasonable ages to start screening patients with ultrasound? Is it 30s, 20s, 40s? Um, but this is, I, I, I don't think I understand uh, well. To give, uh, to give uh, studies without I mean, evaluating. To, to, no, to start, to start the evaluation, what do you think is in your patients? What, what age do you use as a cutoff to do the first ultrasound to, to evaluate? Oh, uh, to answer this question, I just um, make reference to the guidelines. Uh, I will check carotid and femoral arteries when the patient needs to be evaluated uh, on his or her cardiovascular disease risk. And current guidelines recommend to do it at least uh, in patients with one cardiovascular risk factors uh, um, when they are 40 years old, or if they are if they have no cardiovascular risk factors. I think they recommend to do it uh, later in the 50 years old. Uh, I'm not exactly, remember, but I will follow the recommendation of clinical guidance to start a cardiovascular disease risk assessment. Yeah, I think that, that makes sense. And the, the, the burden, I, I think here, at least in, in the Bronx where we work, we see a, such a high burden of, of cardiovascular risk factors, even in the younger. I'm not sure the Bronx, but in the U.S., I think with the incidence of obesity and and, and the food uh, that people eat here. So uh, I think following that, there's an, another question by Rob Ostel. Uh, what in what interventions do you expect can cause regression in atherosclerotic plaque uh, and or thicken the fi the fibrous cap? He's saying I think is are they 
Have you seen any interventions in lifestyle or only statins or has that been studied? I think that's where he's aiming with the question. Um, yes, well, I tried to answer this with this, the with, um, analysis that we did in the PESA study. We tried to uh, find out at which level of LDL cholesterol, people's don't, people don't have atherosclerosis. And we find out that you have to be an LDL, you have to have an LDL level of cholesterol le less than 70 to don't develop atherosclerosis. So I would say that the interventions that uh, down the uh, low down the, the level of LDL are the only intervention that may uh, they, they halt the uh, atherosclerosis progression or atherosclerosis development. I think LDL, LDL is still the key factor here. That sounds great. No matter how you 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 down down the level of, of LDL is by diet, lifestyle. For sure, this is better because you control all the cardiovascular risk factors. If you improve your lifestyles, you control also hypertension, obesity, etc. But if you, uh, despite this lifestyle, your LDL is still high, you will need uh, a statins or uh, any other lipid drug therapy to, to down put down your levels of LDL. It's still the key here. I like that. I love that. Yeah, not everyone has the same effects with the intervention as well. So we have a way to measure it that is the LDL level. So uh, that should be measured, I agree. So uh, thank you very much. I think this was a, a very, very interesting topic and, and an outstanding lecture. And so I look forward to, to see more research in the topic and possibly in different populations and with different interventions is so promising. and. And hopefully we'll we'll see you around New York or in Madrid soon. Oh, I hope uh, I will be happy to welcome you here to Spain to Madrid. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Gracias.